And welcome everyone to Rock M Radio. Uh, this is a brand new live broadcast, uh, specifically for our Rock M Plus subscribers, of Dive Cuts. We're on Season 7. Uh, as you can see, if you're watching us on YouTube, hello. Uh, I am your host, Sam Snelling. Uh, we don't know where Matt Harris is these days. He's getting ready for a giant trip. Uh, he was going to be unavailable this week, so we're rolling out Matt Watkins. Uh, and Watkins and I are going to talk all about the transfer portal because that is literally the only thing going on in college basketball news these days as well, other than you know the coaching carousel, which is always entertaining. Uh, Matt down there in, in central, uh, central southwest county, uh, St. Louis County, how are you? Doing all right. How are you? I am. I am well. I'm doing well. It's a little gray here. the uh, The skies are cloudy. It's misting, raining, and all that kind of stuff, which which absolutely sucks. Uh, but uh, it's been a pretty eventful news week so far. We've had uh, we've had multiple uh, sort of things happening. I think you know we could probably start a little bit with. Uh, with the news of John Calipari officially accepting the position at at Arkansas, uh, so Eric Musselman went to USC because Andy Enfield went to SMU because SMU fired their second year coach, who like was by all means successful in his second year, uh, and and so all that led to uh, John Calipari in Kentucky, basically. Uh, getting their divorce i think both sides are relieved and uh and certainly it opens up uh, a lot of news in and around kentucky which is a big big name in the sport guys are asking out of letters of, of intent they're decommitting um and so now we have all this stuff going on and then oh by the way a, a former five-star kid from kansas city by the name of mark mitchell Dropped his name into the transfer portal after two, you know, really pretty solid years at Duke. Uh, and and so he's in the portal. And all of this stuff is happening. Meanwhile, we still have, you know, the, this idea that Missouri is looking at, you know, Javon Porter, Terrace Reed. Uh, they've already got a commitment from Jacob Cruz. Matt, uh, let's start with with the uh, the, the kid from the, the, the Kansas side of, of Kansas City, uh, our good friend Mark <laughs> Mitchell. Uh, and and sort of him dropping into the porter. What was your sort of initial reaction there? Um, I guess a, <clears throat> excuse me, a little surprised. Um, you know, he he's had a good career at Duke. He's uh, he's a good college basketball player. And I guess when you're at Duke and you're going into your junior year and you are classified as a good college basketball player, you're probably going to get recruited over. And I think to some extent that happened. I mean, obviously, Duke is going to bring in a bunch of blue chip prospects every year, including next Super year, flag. Flag, <laughs> um, who is the bluest of blue chip prospects. So <clears throat> I think uh, Mark probably saw his time and role in Duke's offense and defense, for that matter, um, kind of diminishing or at least not growing. Mm -hmm. how he would hope. Um, so I guess in all in all, it's not totally surprising, but still, when you get a former five-star kid, who's, you know, he, he was playing, playing well this year. Um, he so, started a lot of games there. Like right. he was, he was not like some guy who struggled to sort of find his role. He had a defined role. You know, maybe it's not like, you know, the role he felt was going to get him to the next level, but, mm -hmm. but, you know, he was certainly an important player for them the last couple of years. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he's uh, he was kind of the uh, do it all type guy for the for a team of pretty. How do I classify it? He had a lot of talent around him. So, um, you know, someone has to do the dirty work. Someone has to do the, the things that not everyone else wants to do to make a team successful. And they ended up making it to the Elite Eight. So they were, by all accounts, a good team. But I mean, when you look at his usage profile it's mostly cuts offensive rebounds running in transition and just an assortment of non mark mitchell centric plays on offense um you know that i think those play types added up to like 60 percent of his offense so um you know in a in not a, 
he wasn't in a huge usage role as it was. So, you know, when you when you bring in, we, you lose Filipowski, but you bring in Flag, it's not going to change. In fact, it might diminish. So, um, in addition to the other players that they have, but uh, you know, that's just the age of uh, college basketball in 2024. I think 10 years ago, he would have been happy content to be a junior at Duke on a really good team with a bunch of good guys coming in, but that's not the game anymore. So he entered the transfer portal and here we are. So uh, a quick look over, you know, his uh, statistical profile. He was not a prolific three point shooter. Uh, He shot at a decent clip as a freshman, about 35% on only 54 uh, attempts, which is just not very many. It's, you know, not quite two a game. Um, his offensive rating, though, as a freshman, uh, 110. So that'd be 1.1 points per possession. Uh, it bumped up to 1.17 or 117.3, if you like the Ken Palm style. Um, on just uh, 20% of possessions, effective field goal percentage good, true shooting percentage good. I mean, these are all like national rank top 300 levels, uh, low turnover rate, uh, good block rate doesn't commit a lot of fouls, draws a good amount of fouls, does get to the free throw line. Um, you know, a nearly 60% uh, shooter from the field. Uh, like you said, a lot of those aren't really like him creating shots at so much as cleaning shots up. Uh, but you have to think that a guy like that, if he is getting into the transfer portal, he is probably going to be looking for a place where his role is going to be a little bit different than it was at Duke. Mm -hmm. Um, And coming out of high school, I mean, he was like a top 15, top 20 level player. And I think, uh, you know, maybe seeing some of his like development stall at Duke and, and not, you know, being able to kind of take another step into a guy who can have the ball in his hands a little more, uh, you know, was probably a deciding factor. And oh, by the way, his uh, old AAU teammate and another Casey uh, K kid just had a breakout season after basically two similar years at Indiana. Like I think Tamar Bates, we've covered extensively, goes to Indiana, is a role guy, is a role guy on some good teams, uh, you know, plays not even like Robin to Trace Jackson's. (laughs) <laughs> uh davis is batman but but you know maybe alfred um <laughs> but you know like being a good player on a, on a on a good team and then going to missouri obviously missouri didn't have a very good year we all know that um but being able to see like your your friend your former au teammate go to a place where they changed his role they changed how he was used and him excelling in that role uh certainly is something that is going to open the eyes of a lot of prospects, especially when there's that, you know, that connection between the two. Yeah, I would think so. I mean, when you look at the transfer portal, or at least how I look at it for the, we'll call the upper third, the guys that have legitimate high major aspirations, um, you know, they're, they're looking at it basically from a financial perspective whether it's the NIL payments that they could get going into the portal that they're not getting at their current school, or just perhaps more importantly, the future earnings that they have at stake of wanting to go professional. You look at a player like uh, Mark Mitchell and, you know, what's his NBA future right now? I'm not a big NBA guy, but I know that the, for a guy who's not super athletic, he's athletic, but not a freak by any means. Um, he he's doesn't so really age Right. He, he doesn't really shoot the ball well. His jumper is needs some work, both result-wise and uh, um, release-wise, we'll call it. Um, but he's not really or hasn't proven to be <clears throat> much of a playmaker um, with the ball in his hands. And, you know, when you, when you look at that as an NBA guy, like, what's your calling card? What's going to get you paid? And I don't know that Mark really has something like that yet. So... If that's not going to happen at Duke, it behooves him to go look someplace that says, hey, we can help you add this facet to your game to get you to the next level. Um, You know, you look at Mizzou in recent years with Kobe Brown. Um, Kobe Brown was a very good college player, even on a bad Mizzou team in 2022, his junior year. Mm -hmm. He put up good numbers, made the All-SEC second team, I believe. But he, he never really had a 
strong shot of being drafted because when you look at a player like that, he can't shoot. He was shooting 22, 23% from outside. Dennis Gates comes in, not attributing it to anyone necessarily, but voila, Kobe Brown shoots 40%, goes in the first round. It's, it, it's just you have to have something at that size, at that position to really differentiate yourself from the, uh, from the rest of the league. And I think that's what Mark is probably looking for this spring. So, you know, you look at, well, it's Mizzou went 0 and 19. True. But this isn't high school recruiting where guys are looking at the prestige of the program. They want to brag to their friends about this. This is nuts and bolts time. Like I want to play basketball for a career. How could I get there? <clears throat> Yeah, and I, I think certainly, uh, you know, we're we're aware that there's interest, obviously, on Missouri's side. Um, there, why wouldn't there be? Uh, there's always going to be interest when really talented guys mm -hmm. uh, hop into the portal. Um, but the good news is, is there's interest on the you know the Mitchell side of things as well, and right. um, you know, like Missouri was a part of the picture on the initial recruitment. Um, you know, I, I did sort of say on the, you know, the Rock and Plus forums, you know, that our information at the time was basically that it was like Duke, 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 UCLA, Duke, Duke, Mizzou. Mm -hmm. um, UCLA has some pull. He has some family out uh, on the West Coast. Uh, UCLA is not looking to be involved this time around. Uh, they're pretty focused on Eric Daly, um, his guy that was it very popular for us? Yeah. Uh, Oklahoma State sort of uh, combo kind of forwardy guy. Yeah, yeah. Very similar player. Um, UCLA is, is hot and heavy on him. I think they're they're going to work it out. Uh, if it doesn't work out for whatever reason, I think they also have another player who might be ahead of uh, might be ahead of, of Mitchell. Um, but certainly Missouri might be able to put themselves in the driver's seat if they're able to uh, sort of pursue this aggressively. Mm -hmm. um, now, is he visiting? I is I that a know. question? Yeah, like <laughs> it, it, for it, me. Yeah, let's, I, let's... I would. I would have to assume that if this progresses, yes, there will be a visit. But uh, you know, we we don't know that at this point in time. Um, he entered the portal yesterday. I'm sure he probably gave it some thought beforehand. And these things don't just miraculously happen. Like. It's not just no one knows who Mark Mitchell is. And then all of a sudden he enters the portal. All these coaches are like, oh, he's pretty good. Let's go talk with him. Yeah. Um, you know, it, there's there's a lot more to it than that. But, uh, you know, I think being that this is a new staff, I think a campus visit is probably required. You know, I, I know he's been to Mizzou before. I know he knows guys there. But uh, this is one of those things, again, it's a business decision. So you want to see – the coach and the staff have a really good plan for how they want to get you to the next level. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I would, I would say at some point there will be, we'll have to uh, wait and find out the, uh, the breaking of visits taking place come one of two ways and they come, the information comes from one of two places, either the player talks to one of the large national recruiting sites or individuals or the coach tells them, um, so, you know, we we believe that there was going to be some movement this weekend on the uh, visit front. And what do you know? Here comes um, Mar Marquise Warwick. Um, just, Did we ever uh, figure out how, like, I, I think, uh, I, I think, think Harris, Harris actually, did that. Yeah, he watched. Here I am yeah, saying he, his name and I'm like, I wish I paid more attention to that. But, uh, <laughs> um, but yes, he just announced um, via one of these, again, large sites that uh, he will be visiting this weekend. So. Um, you can you can kind of feel it out for when when something's going to happen. You you kind of get a feel for it. You hear things from various places, and they're like, "Yeah, I, I think this is going to happen," but you're never going to confirm it until someone's on campus and they get seen, or they can't deny it anymore. Well, and I would also add, like when it comes to this sort of information, that guys like Warwick are a lot more likely mm -hmm. to broadcast their recruiting, and guys like Mitchell um who went through it already um you know like the the really really high level guys right uh that you know their initial recruitment was covered by all the national outlets they tend to honestly be quieter um you know i think you could probably see that a lot with like caleb love last year as a good example you know like 
Caleb was a guy who went into the portal, like leaving North Carolina. Uh, like we knew about the interest between Mizzou and, and, and the loves. And, uh, we knew there were other schools involved. Like, I think, you know, you had heard, uh, you know, heard that, you know, Michigan was, was involved and then, you know, but nobody knew if like when he went up there, he just went up there and next thing you know, he's, he's, you know, he's committed and, uh, and that's just sort of, you know, how it happens. And, and I think, you know, basically what it is, is the, the higher level guys, it is very, very much a business decision. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I am, I am not interested in like the publicity. I want to get to this place. I want to work on my game. I want to get my <laughs> NIL check, uh, you know, and I want to get to work. And, and I think a lot of those guys approach it. I think we're probably going to have a similar situation um, you know, and you're kind of even seeing it a lot with, with like Terrace Reed. I mean, Reed, uh, you know, there's been very little out of his camp. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I know that it leaked that, uh, that he was on campus and it, it turned out, like you said, like somebody spotted him, um, and he was, he was on campus, uh, in Kansas state. And so it's just like, okay, like that's kind of how it happened. So we've got our spotters uh in and around columbia and hoping that that will get we'll get clued in to uh to anybody who we're not really aware of that that might be visiting um but yeah guys like by like warwick tend to be uh a little bit more like they'll 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 talk to um you know uh two four what is it who's our guy uh you, you call him sam 2.0 um oh yeah that's what's his, that's what's his Twitter handle. Name, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh yeah, it's the two four seven handle? high school hoops. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, he does great work. You should follow him if you're not already. And some Tosiril has been released from his letter of intent. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's yeah, a, just pulling pulling up Twitter here. I was gonna see if I could find that guy's handle. Spotters. It reminds me of uh, right after Dennis Gates was hired and. We had someone actually on staff here see uh, Sean East on campus, and we were all talking about that. And then later the day, later that day, the bat signal comes out, and we're like, "Oh, it must be Sean East." It was actually DeAndre Golston who committed that day, even though Sean East was on campus. Um, so that kind of threw us for a loop, even though it eventually happened there shortly thereafter. Yeah. But it's you know you can you can know who's on campus. You can literally lay eyes on him, and you get a commitment, and it's not even him. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, well, all right, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we and Lord knows we've been there uh, with with thinking that a commitment was one thing and it ends up being something completely different. Yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> so let's you talk about <laughs> let's talk about the uh, the other uh, really kind of big news today. Uh, mm-hmm. which was, uh, let me pop this banner up here, uh, Jaden Quaintance, a uh, familiar name, five-star freshman, uh, spurned Missouri back in, what what was it, December? It was something, November? He did, no, he, he signed early, I think. He ended up signing early, so it was November. Um, yes, so Jaden Quaintance committed to Kentucky, uh, his father was very much steering that boat. Big fan of Cal and the Kentucky brand. Cal is no longer a part of the Kentucky brand. Uh, but Cal uh, does have a huge NIL budget at the at University of Arkansas now. Um, they are reporting it as like between five and seven million dollars, which uh, that's a lot. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that would definitely you know be the top in the sec you know i think missouri was probably in like i I think the article said that missouri was kind of towards the top of the sec this year and i'd be a little skeptical that they they were spending as much money as they were but you know who knows um but uh i think the average tends to be probably between one and a half and and two and a half million somewhere in there for for you know the upper tier schools so to basically double that and more uh, certainly gives Cal deep pockets. Uh, Quaintance, I don't really know what to think here because Missouri is going to be really young and they were still pursuing Quaintance. He is a guy you're going to have for two years. That's hard to turn down. He's a certified pro. He's a guy that you're definitely like going to play if you get him. 
he's going to play all over the place because he's really, really good. Um, I mean, he's not like a deft ball handler or anything like that, but he's a guy that can make a lot happen uh, defensively right away. Uh, and if you can develop his offensive skills, like just an absolute dominating talent. Um, but I don't know. Um, you think Missouri has a shot with this guy? Of all the guys we're going to talk about tonight, I would say he's the lowest, um, just me personally. Um, you know, Mizzou did recruit him well. A lot of this information can be owed to our absentee, Matt, tonight. Um, but Mizzou did a really good job recruiting him. I think the family was into Dennis Gates. I think the player himself was into Dennis Gates. Um, you know, but – Kentucky hasn't been Kentucky of recent years as far as wins, tournament success, and what have you. They're still a very good program or have been a very good program under John Calipari. Maybe not as good as the Kentucky fans want it to be, but they were still a three seed. (laughs) The thing about Cal is he was still putting guys in the NBA. You know, if, if you look at any coach in the college basketball ranks right now, who would you be most comfortable about putting you into the NBA if you were a five-star coming out of high school? shashevsky has gone. Jay Wright's gone. Bill Self, you know, that, that's a fair, fair argument, but sheer volume, John Calipari, you know, especially yeah. at Kentucky. And, the and thing John was, Calipari will let you know about that too, that <laughs> there's the amount of money that are tied up in Kentucky right. players contracts is, is at a substantial number. And, you had that combined with the fact that he was coaching a blue blood institution that had won recent national championships. And up until 2020 was easily one of the best programs in the sport top five. Um, You know, so when you look at that, I think the decision's kind of easy. Now you take Cal out of there and put him in Arkansas. He's still going to get guys. He's got the money to do it. Cal knows how to recruit. (laughs) It's the one thing that I always chuckle at, like, um, you know, I saw a tweet the other day and shared it when someone's like, oh, God, John Calipari can finally recruit now that he's got all this money at NI- in NIL at Arkansas. Like, that's never been a problem. He's always been able to do that. It's just that he skews more towards high school talent versus portal guys. And the portal guys he got have been hit or miss. You know, Antonio Reeves was very good. Oscar Shibway was very good statistically. may not have been the best fit for what they were trying to do, but still an elite player. Um, So you look at, or excuse me, look at Arkansas now. How quickly can he get that going there? Is it this class? Is he going to bring in the number one class? Is everyone going to follow him there? I don't think so, Um, but I think a lot of them will. And the question to me is, though, when you look at that, Arkansas has zero players on the roster right now, none. Not a high school signee, not a walk-on, not a scholarship player, not a transfer, none. They have no players. It is April 10th. The portal is well underway, and you have a coach who hasn't really embraced the portal, um, at least successfully compared to some of his counterparts. So when you look at that roster, if you're a high school recruit right now, and like, what's it going to look like next year? We have absolutely no idea who's going to be on the team. Um, so it, it does take a little bit more of a leap of faith than, say, Kentucky, who, you know, they lose a lot of guys after one year, but they bring a fair amount back and they've got the machine going where they've got five number one, top five, whatever prospects coming in. Arkansas, we don't know, you know. So as far as Jane Quaintance go, goes, um, you know, I think there's a little bit more hesitation with me than he's just going to follow Calipari. That said, everyone in the country would love to add him, and it's going to be an uphill battle for Mizzou, despite the good relationship. <clears throat> yeah, I, you know, I think if Missouri was coming off a better season, there, you know, I might feel mm-hmm. a little, little, little better about it. Um, but when you couple, uh, so there's a couple things. When you couple the uh, the amount of young players they do have coming in, the positions of the players that they have coming in, and you have the potential to go out and and sort of bolster kind of like the you know the interior size, like we'll just say like the three, four, five position. Uh, they've already kind of done that with uh, with Jacob Cruz, who's sort of that like three, four hybrid. 
we sort of look at Mark Mitchell as like that three, four hybrid kind of guy. Um, you know, acquaintance is a guy who can play the five can play the four. Uh, eventually he could probably play the three. Um, so you're, you're also just kind of reaching a point where there's a lot of bodies that are mm-hmm. kind of in this realm. Er, and even like some of the guys that they haven't signed, like, you know, there's still a possibility of Javon Porter. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, Terrace Reed, yeah, like, you know, so it's just like, like there's, <clears throat> there's a lot going on and, you know, obviously Missouri still has to like get commitments from guys and still has to sign guys and make sure that, you know, they're, they're, they're ready to go uh, on that side of it. Um, I tend to think that I think you pursue them and, uh, and you see if you can land it. I'm a, always sort of the, the guy who's like, you know what, if you can get, talent you get the talent you figure it out later um but i sort of see this as a situation where i feel like you probably have to feel better about where you're at with mitchell uh you're definitely going to feel better where you're at with with porter Mm -hmm. uh and even though like you know acquaintance may be uh you know eventually like a higher ceiling on both uh better defender right out of the gate um You know, that's that's still something where it's just like, um, what do they say? A, a bird in hand is better than two in the bush. Um, it's sort of like kind of one of those things. I would put the odds as long on Queens. Um, not impossible, uh, but long. Uh, and realistically, if you re-engage and, and Hammond and, uh, and, and the misses are like, yeah, like we still love Dennis Gates. We want to sign up and you take him, um, which I think is a, kind of a natural sort of pivot for what I really kind of wanted to decide. And I think we kind of went long in both those spots. Uh, but really, like this is what it kind of comes down to for me is, is what do you do at the four spot? Uh, Missouri's roster. Nobody is transferred. <laughs> like... like not yet anyway. I, right. Like <laughs> there's still time. There's still time. Um but like you're coming off a historically bad season and everyone is just like, no, like I'm I'm still on board. And like that's that's great. It's great. Mm-hmm. And I, I you know, I think it speaks to some of the things that we talked about kind of during, you know, like the last couple months about like the culture and and you know the approach and you know guys were still bought in and like they were showing up they were competing hard uh that's all those are all good signs but um you know trent pierce is a hybrid combo forward aiden shaw uh Technically, I think we would kind of classify him as, as like a hybrid combo for you like to call him a post. Um, he well, plays like that. He does play like that. The numbers call him a post. <laughs> yes. As weird as that is, 6'8", athletic freak Aiden Shaw was most similar to a guy like Omar Ballo. Yeah. <laughs> he that does, it, does not it shoot blows outside my mind, of like, it's true, yeah. but it's true. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> still, you know, what we'll, we'll sort of... Well, well, loosely, and that's why I've always kind of liked the term like combo forward, right? Like, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, I think somebody who, you know, athletically can guard the three spot if you need, uh, is probably maybe more comfortable in the four spot. And then in a pinch, if you need him at the five, they can do that too. Like that's sort of like the combo. Um, so yeah, so Aiden Shaw, Trent Pierce. Jordan Butler played a few possessions at the four. I think, you know, like if you bring in a wider sort of bigger body, you could see him getting minutes at the four. Uh, Jake Cruz. You know, and now we're talking about what's that wing. (laughs) I mean, he, but he's six, eight, he's six, eight. That's a good thing. (laughs) Uh, He, yeah, good size. He's like, he's not like a super plus athlete. So like I would, I would call him a combo forward. Uh, he's not somebody I want guarding the other team's best player, um, but he can hold his own on the wing if he needs to. Uh, probably like more comfortable in that four spot. So that's, I mean, we're already at like four, what, four or five dudes. 
And now you're talking about Mark Mitchell, who's kind of that guy. You're talking about Javon Porter, who's kind of that guy. Mm-hmm. You're talking about Jaden Quaintance, who's definitely that guy. Um, what do you do? What do you do? Uh, are we talking about one of these guys? Are we talking about two of these guys? Because you've already got one in the transfer portal class now in Cruz. What do you do? Well, just the way I conceptualize it, and I think this is helpful, at least for me, to kind of explain where I'm coming from. I look at the front court as three different positions. I'll take the wings out. Don't care about the guards for the moment right now. I look at three types. You kind of have to have size. I don't put a a strict um, measurement on it, but 6'8 is kind of the smallest that I'm looking at for these guys when I'm looking at them statistically. I've got the the postmen, the, the guys who are more traditional back to the basket players who don't really create any offense either off the bounce or off the pass. And they don't really shoot from outside. Those are the post guys to me. That's like, that's going to be like Umar Balo. It's like, you know, for Missouri's purposes, it'll be, you know, Peyton Marshall. Terrace uh, Reed would be an Terrace addition Reed. into that category, yeah. at least for now. Again, how they profile statistically. I didn't bring up Marcus Allen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's kind of more of a wing. We'll, we'll yeah. <laughs> out of this for now. Um, but then we go to the stretch guys, which are the same guy, except they can shoot from outside. It's the same profile. You just, you add in the shot. And then I look at the combo forwards as guys who are of that same profile, but can make plays off the bounce or off the pass. They can't necessarily shoot, but they can dribble, they can pass, um, which gives you the ability to flex them outside, make plays from the elbows, whatever. Kobe Brown was the epitome of the ideal combo forward in this offense. He could shoot, he could pass, he could dribble, and he could play inside. Um, He was a little undersized, but, you know, for our purposes here, I think that's kind of how I break down those three. So when you look at um, a Mark Mitchell, believe it or not, despite his outside shot, he kind of fits in that middle category. He has shot a little bit from outside. Um, he's not a true post. He's not really a playmaker. So I kind of slot him in that stretch category. That's where I would also slot Javon Porter. Um, he can pass a little bit, a little bit better, or has passed a little bit better, but you know, he's, he's not really a playmaker. Terrace Reed goes into the posts for now. Um, and Quaintance can probably flex between the stretch to the interior postman maybe you can develop the uh you know the passing the dribbling aspect <clears throat> but we'd have to bring matt harrison on that since he's watched literally every second of every minute, minute that he's played um so that's kind of how i look at it so if you you look at it, those positions you've got jordan butler who i he didn't shoot it well but again he shot it from outside more of a stretch guy you've got trent pierce stretch guy pure and simple it wasn't much of a playmaker but did shoot it um, a little light for the inside, but still got good length. Um, Aiden Shaw, believe it or not, was our only post guy from a year ago <laughs> um, because he didn't shoot, he didn't dribble, and he didn't pass. Um, yeah. You know, Connor Vanover slid into the stretch five. Um, you know, so it's when you look at it like that, I think it kind of breaks it down. But to me, that's less important than the actual number of spots you have available. I don't think you can take more than two post guys or two forwards, I should say. You've already got Jacob Cruz. You're really light at guard right now. Your your entire guard backcourt dynamic right now is Anthony Robinson and T.O. Barrett. Sophomore who had an up and down freshman year, talented, promising, yes. Proven, no. T.O. Barrett hasn't stepped foot on the court. I think the staff realizes it. I think we realize it, that they're going to take two guards, you know? So when you add in that to Cruz, you're already at three guys. I don't see them getting six, seven, eight guys in the portal this year. I just do not see it happening. So, you know, it's, it's kind of how you mix those two additions in the front court in what roles do they have? You know, if you bring in a Mark Mitchell and a Terrace Reed, they play a little bit differently in the front court. Mark Mitchell and Javon Porter play kind of similarly. Javon's a better shooter. Um, Mark is better on the inside, but, you know, you could see a little bit of a difference there. But uh, Quaintance, he's flexible enough that you could put him in multiple spots or multiple roles, I should say, to uh, be effective. So 
Long, long story short, I don't know, but there is a bulk of bodies, um, if not in width, in amount, um, at the Missouri front court spots right now. So I'd look for them to add to who they will be. Who knows? But, uh, you know, there's the options have doubled since the last time we spoke about this. Right. And, you know, I, and I will say, like, from uh, from our perspective and from or from my perspective, definitely, I don't want to speak for anybody else. Um, I think like this sort of also couples with a little bit of where I would critique uh, the way that they address their freshman class um, in the fall. And, you know, obviously hindsight being 2020, you you don't know that you're going to go through the season that they went through. You don't know that you're just going to have a miserable experience uh, trying to get through conference play. Uh, And each of the five guys that are signed and coming in, like, I understand all of the, the additions in a vacuum, right? Like each one in a vacuum. But collectively, like five spots is a lot on mm-hmm. freshmen. If you were going to pursue Queens, I think you're like, if you're going to do it again, if you're going to press Dennis Gates to do it again, I kind of feel like that at that point, he's probably going to have to make a decision on either Burns or Marshall. Um, mainly because like, you know, you're not really getting great ball handling from any of the other, you know, the, the three, you know, guard wing guys that you're bringing in, you know, Barrett, you know, by all accounts is, is a lot more of a combo guard at this point. Does he project as a point guard? Perhaps, um, you know, honor is a wing, uh, you know, Marcus Allen is, is a wing, maybe like a, a hint towards the, you know, the, the combo forward spot. Um, but I understand like, you know, they didn't, they, they've had these struggles with, with rebounding. They've had sort of interior defense, uh, you know, trouble and wanting to kind of make sure that you can increase that size. They went ahead and took an additional post. Um, and, and now you're at the point where you don't have enough ball handling on your roster you're actively pursuing at least two guards. You have guys that are kind of in that mix that did play some that were like on the roster that you like their talent. Uh, you know, specifically the three freshmen, um, three freshmen from this past year, the guys that will be sophomores, Mm -hmm. um, you know, at some point you've got to be able to say like, no, like we, we like you a lot, but, like we need to make sure that like we're, I I don't think you can take more than than five guys and if you're going to pursue Queens then it should have been four, I think three to four freshmen every year should be your goal. And then you try to retain as much of those guys, you try to recruit as high a level of guys as you can, uh, and and when you take that fifth guy like it just there's only so many minutes so you know unless they're going to get to <clears throat> you know, like 16 spots uh, and using NIL money to like have walk-ons. Like, you know, I, I really, realistically, like Javon Porter could very easily be a walk-on. Um, you know, just you just pay for their schooling with NIL. Um, it, but it, it definitely creates a, a glut in an area where they've been short the last few years. Uh, and now you need ball handling. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, looking at it, <clears throat> I agree with you that the freshman class is, there's just a lot there and it skews towards the front court side. But I will say that through two years in the portal, Mizzou really struggled to bring in big guys. And the reason why it's really hard to bring in big guys in the portal, there's just not that many of them. They're hard to find. They're even harder to land. It does feel <clears throat> like this cycle though does have way more than there have previous been, years which is ironic especially now that we've got <laughs> three maybe four guys who would project well on mizzou's roster right after mizzou takes a large freshman class in the front court but i look at it like <clears throat> they recognize that that's struggle um they had a good year they were able to recruit high school kids they were receptive to what mizzou was selling and they realized that 
you know, we need to develop these guys. So we brought in a couple guys who we can develop. Is it the best strategy in hindsight? Who knows? But I, I at least see that there was some sort of thinking behind it that, hey, let's stockpile a few of these guys, develop them, and then we won't have to scramble in April and May. And when Caden Shedrick turns us down, go look at Jimmy Bell, then go look at Connor Vanover and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, we've got those guys. And when you look at the portal, wings, shooting guards, those guys you can find in the spades. You know, I, I sift through them every day. And I would say those two positions, even though they're kind of the same thing, are probably like, ah, gosh, 50 to 60% of the quality guys coming in the portal. Um, you know, we've got a large combo forward class this year in the in the portal, a lot of skilled six, seven, six, eight, six, nine guys who can do multiple things. Um, but the post group and the point guard group, the post group especially is small. Um, you know, you've got Terrace Reed in there and a few other um, big names. Um, but point guards are kind of difficult to find as well. And they're always highly prioritized. So, um, you know, looking at high school recruiting and bringing it back to that, recruit point guards, recruit big men. And you can always find adequate replacements in the portal for everything else. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, <laughs> I think, uh, I think it comes down to like, if you were to make a priority list out of the, the remaining options kind of in the front court, <clears throat> kind of include um, anyone that might sort of be tangentially uh, connected to a wing spot. So Mark Mitchell included. Uh, who, who it would be your priority? Um, or are you basically saying like, this is what we have for the spot or taking the first guy to commit? Do I have to factor in likelihood of signing? <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with not. Okay. Um, you know, at this point, acquaintance is probably the top priority there. Um, you know, he's, he's got a lot of things. He's got versatility. He's a very good defensive player, and he can guard both big men and more skilled, um, smaller forwards. Um, so I think you could anchor your defense with him. And if you were looking at a guy like that, I think as the number two, you'd probably want to look at a guy like Javon Porter because his skill set is completely different than what Jane Quaintance is. You've got a guy who albeit was a little bit shakier shooting the ball last year, a 6'11 guy who can dribble, who can pass a little bit, and who can shoot jumpers. You put those two guys together, you've got a nice contrast. Now, if Mark Mitchell is the priority, Javon Porter may not be the best fit to go alongside of him. You know, it's just, it kind of is a one-in, one-out type scenario about, you know, who fills the first spot, but Quaintance, I think is, would be your top priority. If not him, I think Mark Mitchell is probably the second player as far as I would take him and figure out the next spot after him. Yeah. <clears throat> and then I, you know, I think like the, the next sort of like, you know, wondering is, you know, what do we think, uh, you know, is wh what do we think is going to happen here? Um, you know, cause I, I do think, what you want and what <clears throat> reality is are often mm -hmm. two different things. And, you know, and that's something that you also kind of have to learn, um, you know, even though like we know Missouri's name, image and likeness situation is healthy, um, you know, that they're still, it, it's going to be tougher to kind of land your top priorities, um, you know, because there are other programs in the SEC who have just had more success. Uh, so if you could, if you can get $250,000 from Missouri, uh, you could also get $250,000 from Florida or from Auburn. Um, you know, if the, the money is the same, um, you know, then you're probably going to choose the team that went to the NCAA tournament last year. Assuming um, role is the same. I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you and I both think um that it is unlikely that Missouri signs um Jaden Quaintance. Mm -hmm. Uh I agree. if you can get Mark Mitchell on campus, you can get him signed, you would take him? Oh yeah, for sure. Like right away. 
Mm-hmm. No, no hesitation whatsoever. What if the next person that wants to commit is Terrace Reed? Hmm. <clears throat> now you've now you've got me in a, <laughs> in a pickle. Um, I don't mind Terrace, and I, I know I feel like I'm I'm constantly giving the 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 cons to bring in Terrace. The the thing that makes me question a little bit about that is that these guys play different roles, and I will say that flat out. Mark Mitchell is not a traditional interior back to the basket big man. Terrace Reed has been that so far um, at Michigan. We've talked about Terrace Reed getting on campus if he were to choose Mizzou, shedding some pounds, gaining some lateral quickness. To me, what you get when you do that is Mark Mitchell. You know, a guy who doesn't really shoot outside, who doesn't really create for others, but is quicker, can defend really well, um, runs really well. You know, so you get two guys who are almost giving you the same thing. I mean, I think it depends on what your other options are, but in that scenario, yeah, I'd probably do it. Um, But you also are understanding here that you're not really going to get any playmaking out of your front court. You're not really going to get any shooting out of your front court. So you're going to have to kind of change what you do. Um, But I think with that combination, you could at least squint and see Mark Mitchell having kind of a renaissance in his career, you know, maybe fixing the the form on his jumper and becoming a little bit more reliable outside. And then, and then if he does that, you've got a really good tandem. Um, so, well, so yeah, I think so I just would, to kind of, yeah, just to kind of jump in, cause you know, like, you know, Terrace at Michigan was listed at 265 uh, and six foot 10. Mark Mitchell last year was listed at 235 and six, nine. Now they, you know, they have pitched Terrace as come, you know, we, we'd like you to lose 20 to 30 pounds and, and improve your, your quickness. So really like you are getting to a point now, Mark Mitchell has at least attempted three point shots. Mm-hmm. Um, Terrace is a, probably a better rebounder. Uh, he's, he's probably a little bit better defensively around the basket. Um, but when you kind of look at it from that standpoint, it is kind of remarkable that you're basically like six nine or six ten, two thirty five. Um, I just like I find it, you know, kind of fascinating that you could have, you know, Tamar Bates and you know Aiden Shaw and Mark Mitchell and Terrace Reed all in the same roster as like the Conzo Martin All Star misses. Well, uh, if, me, if only we me, could coax Caleb Love back in the and, and let sign me him blow up your mind. <laughs> Tamar Bates, Caleb Love, Aiden Shaw, Terrace Reed, and Mark Mitchell. All Missouri State Bears next year with Kanza Martin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not being serious, but it, it would be wild to just think about that, um, considering Kanza Martin recruited all of those guys pretty heavily, had varying degrees of finishes somewhere between second and fourth with all of them. Um, if he lands two of them, career trajectory very well changes at Mizzou, doesn't land any of them. And then they all decide, you know what? We really like Conzo. He's the one guy that we all liked, and we all just want to go play in Springfield. Yeah, we all really liked him. We just didn't want to play for him then. Now that we're we're uh, <clears throat> older and wiser. Um, uh, no, so, I, you know, I think that that kind of, uh, you know, wraps up a bit of our conversation on the four spot. It is, it is interesting, you know, because it is one of those things where it was a priority. And I think mm-hmm. for like the last few weeks, we've been like Javon Terrace, Javon Terrace, Javon Terrace. And now all of a sudden, like, you know, Mark Mitchell and you hear, uh, you know, you hear that there is mutual interest that that does throw a wrench in because I don't think you have unlimited spots. Um, you know, I, I realize Dennis wants to have like a, a big deep roster, uh, you know, but it, that's a lot of people to kind of keep involved. And, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and certainly the more bodies you add from the, the portal, like the, the fewer opportunities you see for younger guys. And I think it's going to be really important to make sure that you're getting opportunities uh, you know, for younger guys who I think we all still kind of believe in their talent. Uh, 
they st- and they still need point guards. Like they still need somebody <laughs> who can dribble the basketball up the court, not turn it over, initiate offense, make a play every now and then. Uh, it, yeah, it does. It does seem Shoot like work is uh, is a priority if he's if he's going to be hitting campus this weekend. Uh, Tony Perkins, I think, is kind of trying to wait it out with IU a little bit. Um, I don't know how that's going to go for him because it does seem like IU has a lot of options, or at least they think they have a lot of options. Um, they certainly have a lot of money, um, so it, it, it'll be interesting to kind of see. Like, I don't, I don't really know. I think we're all like you, you and I, uh, and I feel like I can speak for for Matt Harris here as well. Is a l- little disappointed and uh, <laughs> and a little disappointed in the approach with the ball handlers so far. Um, and not that we don't like Perkins, uh, I think I I think we all like Perkins. I I don't know that I would classify Warwick as a like even as a combo guard. Um, and I, I feel like you you need more ball handling. Um, but that's not what they're doing, at least not so far. So uh, I don't know if you have anything else you want to touch on with the point guard spot. Uh, we are kind of getting close to the end here. Nope. I, uh, I do like Tony. I think he'd be a good fit. I think his fit kind of matters with who else they're bringing in. I'm not sure that Warwick and Perkins are the best <clears throat> synergistic effect at the uh, backcourt, but you know, who knows? Maybe they are. Um, I'm just a guy on a podcast with a <laughs> Royal blue shirt on repping my uh, big blue nation over here. Um, <laughs> or, or are, is that slew uh, uh, colors now? Cause uh, I know you met your boy, uh, Josh shirts uh, out having dinner the other night. Um, I, I know this is not a, a slew podcast, but, uh, we are both St. Louis. Uh, uh, I, I'm a native. You're a transplant now. Transplant. Um, but yeah, you were out for dinner and met Josh Shirts, and and uh, even even saw him with a, a couple uh, or at least one assistant that that turned out to be what was that Boysvert you saw Zach mm-hmm. Boysvert. Yep. Yeah, I could break the news and beat Pete Thamel, but I didn't. I. I... I yeah. I will just. Uh, I will say <laughs> that. As a fan of basketball, um, and, you know, and I, I grew up going to a lot of SLU games. Um, you know, when my brother uh, finished playing in college, my parents, I think, were uh, missing college basketball, going to a lot of college basketball games. I was still mm-hmm. playing, uh, but my dad got season tickets with some friends, and so I went to a lot of SLU games growing up. Uh, I should also point out that my dad uh, played uh, at what is now Missouri State. Um uh, and uh, back then it was like Southwest Teachers College or something, and they played mm-hmm. NAIA. Um, but uh, uh, but at the time, Charlie Spoonhour was a uh, like a you know manager, you know like assistant coach kind of thing. You know back then there was a lot of blurred lines on some of those positions. Uh, and so Spoonhour was like I don't want to he's not a family friend, but a family acquaintance. Uh, and so when he got the job at SLU, like my parents were like really, really involved and in going to a lot of games. And so I grew up on, on a lot of SLU basketball. I, I hated Travis Ford, uh, as basketball coach. I don't know him personally, so I don't want to say that I, I hate him or who he is or anything like that. Uh, I don't know him. I don't like watching his teams play basketball. Um, I am excited about Josh shirts. Um, I like watching good basketball <clears throat> and he plays a really fun style and, and, he does. Uh, and Watkins, like, are we going to have little, you know, uh, dive cuts meet up at, uh, at a slew game this upcoming year? What watch us some cream Abdul Jabbar. You know, we, we could just get Josh shirts on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> hey, now that you're such good friends, we, uh, I mean, we're best, we're best buds <laughs> at this point. Um, you know, you're one of like talk, three people he knows in St. Louis. <laughs> you know, I have to imagine outside of big, big money boosters and faculty or staff members, I had to have been one of the first people to talk with him since he became SLU's head coach. He hadn't even been officially announced. Yeah. Um, you know, well, I guess he was announced, but he hadn't had his introductory press conference. Um, and no one else 
recognized him when he came in, but I did immediately. I mean, well, he is just kind of like a short, bald guy. So he's like... the most noticeable <laughs> guy. And I'll tell you what, <clears throat> I do. I've never been a SLU fan. I don't actively root for them, but I have no interest in seeing them succeed. It will be hard for me not to at least root for him because he is, you know, he, he's a new coach. Every guy is nice, but I've, I've met many, many coaches over the years and he is a genuinely nice guy. Um, he coaches a great, exceedingly fun style of play. He's going to be bringing a bunch of guys from Indiana state who are a great team to watch. Um, and he told me that, <laughs> that they're, most of them are coming with. Um, but, you know, it, it's just like, what do you dislike about this? And, yeah. you know, I, I can't really find much. Maybe maybe that'll change. But uh, I hope he has great success in one year and, and find something bigger and better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope he does not stick to the words of his, his press conference as he was talking about, you know, building a Gonzaga of the uh, of the Midwest. He could go um, coaching Gonzaga after Fuse left. Hey, there, you, there you go. Um, <laughs> no, there. Uh, for anybody who like wants to know more about shirts, uh, he does have a really fascinating story. Like, mm -hmm. absolutely fascinating. Was <clears> like <throat> a a star youth tennis player. And burnt out on tennis. His dad was apparently like a big tennis player. There's a really, really great pro. Was it? Was, was that CJ Moore that wrote that? Somebody could have been the athletic. I think he uh, typically does the best stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I feel like I probably definitely read it because it was it was like oh CJ wrote it. I feel like I have to read it. Um, but no, it, I'm certain it was on the athletic. Uh, fantastic story. Uh, he is a really, really interesting guy. Mm -hmm. uh, his his <laughs> his background is wild he never played uh, college basketball i'm not even sure if he played high school basketball no he did play college like it was but it was weird he didn't graduate high school he had to get a ged and went to junior college to play huh. <laughs> it's a Must really like yeah it's 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 wild his his life is is wild uh you can go I, read that yeah. story again yeah, highly recommend reading the the athletic story. Um, if you're if you're an athletic subscriber, is is a really really interesting uh, guy. Uh, but we're we're done talking about SLU. Um, <laughs> that was probably the longest uh, segment ever on SLU basketball. Um, but yeah, so we're we're going to be keeping track of of all the the transfer portal <clears throat> stuff. Uh, we've got more deep dives coming. Um, you know, thanks to thanks to Synergy, thanks to your subscriptions. Yes. Um, if you are subscribing <clears throat> to Rock and Plus, you are helping us pay for tools that, mm -hmm. that make these things possible. Um, it is it is super super cool. Uh, Synergy, it, Synergy is an amazing service, but it is not cheap, and we're not looking to profit <laughs> off of this. Um, you know, it just it helps offset our out of pocket costs to bring you what we want to bring you, and yeah. we think it's good. So. Yeah, it's super cool. Uh, so if you're listening to this on like the regular podcast feed, you're not subscribed, head over, head over to rockm.plus, uh, get subscribed. Uh, you can check out all the stuff that's going on uh, on the on the forums. The basketball forums are hot and heavy. Uh, uh, football transfer portal is coming up, and and we hope to have uh, as good a coverage uh, on that side as we do on the basketball Drink. side. Um, yeah, it's a little tougher to to kind of get that stuff uh, out of the football program than it is the basketball program. But uh, but you know, I think we're we're building a great thing. Um, and so, thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, we'll be back next week. I don't know if you're going to join me next week or if I'm going to you know try. To find I think I'm going to be here for perpetuity. With uh, I think with, Matt with, Harris has basically quit and is yeah, just. So, leave he, he, the podcast he's moving yeah. he's moving to become a permanent resident uh and everton fan um from one <laughs> sack, sack program to the next <laughs> <laughs> yeah Hopefully going, going, going relegation while he's there <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah good, all right good, no more good soccer thing, talk. yeah good, we good talk we so don't have soccer yeah <laughs> There, there, there is a chance that Everton gets uh, relegated, mostly because they're uh, they've gotten dinged a lot. Um, but he, he's going to go watch them. Uh, maybe he'll be back at some point. Uh, but yeah, so we'll be back next week with uh, with more Portal Talk. Hopefully, we've got commitments uh, to talk about by then. Um, it should be a busy weekend, at least for visits. 
you know, we know for sure, for sure on one, uh, we are expecting at least probably a couple more uh, that that could happen as well. Um, and we'll let at you least know as next we're... week. Yeah, yeah. The dead period ends midnight on Thursday, so Friday should be a flood. Um, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you on the forums. We'll see you on, uh, uh, you know, Rockham Nation, Rockham dot plus, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Rock M Radio, a proud partner of Fans First Sports Network. Rock M Radio is the official podcast network of Rock M Plus, a new and exciting subscription service provided by me and the other voices of Rock M Radio. Please take a few moments to head over to rockm.plus and sign up for an account today. The cost is only $5 a month and benefits include access to our live podcast, a subscriber-only message board, weekly newsletters, and more. If you enjoyed this episode of Rock M Radio and would like to see more just like it beamed directly into your personal device, make sure to click the subscribe button below and tell your friends. Our podcast feed is available through the Apple Podcast app for iPhone, Google Podcast app for Android, whatever app you listen to your podcast, you can also find Rock M Radio on Spotify. If you're looking for a podcast about your favorite team that is not the Missouri Tigers, Fan First Sports Network is your answer. A full podcast network loaded with the team-specific podcasts covering Major League Baseball, the NFL, NHL, NBA, MLS, and more. And we'll be back with more episodes of Rock and Radio coming to you soon.